You got my good side? <laughs> How is everybody doing today? Welcome to the, uh, to the 42nd webinar that we're going to, that uh, as part of our series here at, uh, at AIM Sports. Um, this one here, we've, uh, we've had a few people that have asked for a, a little bit deeper into the alarms and and um, and so what we've what we're going to talk about today is 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 deeper into alarms plus a few other things but the 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 process of building the this webinar series has has uh, has I thought about it a lot and we've we've built some building blocks right so we've started with with a couple of webinars that we did before and maybe um, uh, maybe Brick will will link them up, but we had some where we talked about configurations. Uh, you know, with Robinson, he came in and he helped us, and we just chatted about configurations and some of the different things. Yeah, and that and was then, a good one. And then we had another one where we were talking about um, alarms itself with 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 Matt Romanowski, and um, and and those are ones that maybe if uh, we're going to kind of take and we're going to build from those. You know, there's functionality, and then there's how do you use it. And and uh, so today, what we're going to try to do, and and you you may have noticed. In, in in many of our recent webinars, we've we've done a lot of the the functionality. How do I do a certain function in the software or or on the hardware? That kind of a thing. And we're we're transitioning, and certainly we've done a lot of it. And every, we'll still probably jump back occasionally, but we have jumped into now maybe uh, okay. How do I use this tool in, in in our real world racing you know sense? And that's what uh, that's what this one is going to be. So if you if you have a chance and you want to learn a little bit more about some of the basics, we may skip over fairly quickly. Brick has. Uh, has given those links. If you're watching this on YouTube, they'll be down in the uh, description box uh, below. Just uh, show more on that. And you're going to have this presentation slides and you're going to have the, uh, uh, the, pre the links to the previous uh, webinars as well. So um, Rick is going to go ahead and put the presentation materials for those of you that are uh, watching this live. If you want to download it, there it is right there. If you want to download it and take a look at, we're going to, there, there's some descriptive slides in there about uh, you know, status variables and triggers and alarms, which are all kind of related. So, uh, but we're going to pretty much jump over those fairly quickly and get into some live data. Okay, so perfect. Uh, go ahead and continue to put out your questions into the question box. If we, uh, as we go, we'll, we'll continue to watch some of those and, uh, and, and bring those up. I would like to start it though, like we often do with, with a poll as we get into, um, in, into our introductions of Chris, the, um, there's a poll for you. What, what, what hardware do you use? What AIMSports hardware do you own and use? The, uh, it's multiple choice, so you can pick uh, multiple ones. If, if, if what you use is not in there, uh, go ahead and uh, put it into the other box, and then, and then uh, in the chat box, other equals whatever it happens to be. We'll just leave that one run for a minute. It might be in your way. If you get done with it, I think when you, uh, when, when you submit it, it, you can, uh, it will get out of your way. Let's start with the presentation. We'll, we'll close that poll in, a, in about a minute or so. I've known Chris for quite a while. But Chris, uh, Chris is from the East Coast over, you know, and, and I met him a number of times at uh, New Jersey Motorsports Park. And then, and then we started chatting a little bit about some data questions occasionally. And then, uh, and then he came and uh, when I was uh, uh, driving impressions, doing some seminars we, we have done over there a couple of years for, for many years. There Chris we go, came in. Bob Zeka. Yeah, Chris, Chris would come in and, and do the, um, uh, assist me and help me. We, we, we would get often, you know, there was a couple of times we'd have like 25 or 30 people in the advanced class and that's a real hands-on kind of a thing. So, so yep. Chris would come over and give us a hand. So what, um, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is just uh, ha have Chris maybe give us a little bit of your background, Chris. And, and, uh, and while you're doing that, I may uh, close that slide and uh, the, the, the poll and, and we'll move on and, and jump into configurations. Go ahead and give us a little bit about yourself. Will do. So uh, those of you that know me know I'm uh, probably as good at talking as Roger, um, although I don't always talk about myself a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of not the best salesman in, in, in a sense. Uh, but I uh, grew up on cars and, you know, wanted to be a race car driver, wanted to spend my college money going to racing school. Uh, of course, my parents uh, said that's not how you do things. And if you do that, you're not going to live in our house, etc. So I went to school to be an aircraft mechanic. Uh, essentially, I figured out that uh, it was the highest level technical education that I could get. It would leverage, uh, I could leverage it to well to get into racing. And uh, I did just that. I got myself a job at the Skip Barber Racing School, packed all my stuff in my little 85 RX-7 and moved across the country and essentially started a new life and uh, pursued racing both as a, as a driver, um, then as an instructor and a coach. 
uh, for hard to believe it's 15 years now. Uh, you know, you go to the uh, convenience store and that date where you can, you're old enough to buy smokes is more or less the year I graduated, which is a little eye opening. Uh, I'm half of you are laughing at me. Age is relative. <laughs> But uh, last few years, I've gotten involved very heavily in endurance racing. I uh, was lucky enough to be able to put a really great team together for the 2017 and 18 seasons of American Endurance Racing. Won a series champion. They don't have class championships. We won a series championship. Uh, did some cool stuff with data along the way that helped us with that. And uh, everything is just built, uh, you know, kind of like what Roger was talking about, building these. Uh, building up to, to where I'm at today, doing a, a lot of data analysis, a lot of coaching, but um, not walking away from my roots of being a mechanic and still doing a lot of the hands-on stuff myself, including, uh, and especially on my own stuff. Perfect. The, uh, a wide varied uh, uh, background in, 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 in our, uh, the passion of all of us that are here. Right. So yeah, one uh, of the catchphrases I use it, I apply to myself, you know, is, is a jack of all trades racing and I, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I don't think there's a job in the sport I haven't done yet. And, and usually I'm good at them. And if I'm not, I learned how to get better. Got, got, and I, got to work. You work till you are right. And exactly. Yeah. I'm pretty much a, the, the typical motorsports guy, right? So the uh, yeah, we, hardworking folks in the, in this business, a uh, couple things before we actually jump in, uh, Andrew uh, just came up with a, with a question that I, that is more of a bigger picture. And, and, and what Andrew is asking is how can we set up a, a wheelie conditional alarm? And it doesn't hit with everybody, I suppose, but the concept of his question using the inertial platform and the GPS data, Data and, and some other things. Boy, that is a, a kind of a, a good lay-in into where we're heading with with this particular one, which is uh, not the specifics of what Andrew asked, but boy, it's it's the, these alarms. If if you can envision them, right? If you if you can think them through, and then the next thing I would do, if, the way I do them, is go into your an, your your data and analysis when you're done, and if you can sit there and and figure out what the conditions are in order to turn on that light or to trigger that, you know, that particular function, whatever it is, boy, if you can do that in analysis, we can then, then you work it backwards and you put it into a, uh, into an alarm or a status variable or, or whatever it happens to be and, and use it internally. So think about that, uh, Andrew, the question is, you know, maybe we'll talk about the, the specifics of that one later, you and I or something, but, or you can contact Chris, but the, um, uh, but the idea of how do you come up with these, boy, it's just, you're looking at your data and you go to your, say to yourself, boy, I wish I could you know, build something that would uh, turn on a light or do something, you know, something, have some sort of a reaction uh, with the gauge. So that, think, I love that you're thinking that way and, uh, and that you would like to look into some, you're, you're going to see some examples today of we've worked it backwards like that uh, with Chris. The other thing I want to make sure you mention, I normally don't do this, but um, uh, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the, um, presentation today, we're going to do our next webinar uh, slide, which we always do. And what I want you to do is be thinking, because the, the, we're going to go back to something that was very popular, and, and you need to maybe have a, a couple minutes to think about it instead of me just throwing it at you. We're going to do a you make the call uh, poll at the end of this, and uh, as part of the next webinar. And uh, you're, we're going to give you... Uh, you know, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're gonna give you about eight, eight choices of different things that you might want to see, and, and we're gonna give you multiple votes. And uh, we're gonna figure out today what uh, what our next webinar is on Tuesday. So, uh, for those of you that uh, are, are able to stick around until the uh, till the that last next webinar slide, please be ready. Uh, start maybe thinking about what you might want to see, and hopefully we have covered it in the in our in our selections here so be ready for uh, your vote to determine what the next uh, next webinar is so be ready for that at the end okay put your thinking caps on <laughs> exactly so here are the, uh, the the next thing we're going to talk about i'm going to kind of hand this over to uh, to, to chris now but uh, what uh, what we're going to talk about is, is this list of things here, and you know some of them will go into deeply, and some of them will uh, will uh, will hit fairly lightly, and make sure you understand the the, the different things. But Chris, if you could give us a, a just a quick run through on on kind of where we're going to go, and then we will jump jump into the differences between status variables, triggers, and alarms, and then jump into live data. Absolutely. So I want to go over you know, the, the, the kind of the summary of, and the, and the catching up of, of where Matt brought us uh, going over some of the functions and possibilities and, and where the stuff is in the software for, you know, for Ray Studio. Uh, we'll discuss 
uh, kind of the types or, or categories of, of warnings, uh, kind of broken it down into uh, kind of a four-way Venn diagram, essentially. Uh, we'll go through building a couple of basic, uh, so to speak, warnings. We'll talk about how we organize them, what order they go in, what lights they light up and messages they send and why, um, and some of the pros and cons of doing it different ways. Uh, which I've found through experience. <laughs> sometimes you succeed and sometimes you learn to succeed. Uh, some tricks to speed the process up. This is uh, between how long it takes you to think it up and how long the process can take if you do it step by step every time. It's a very time consuming process. So we'll, we'll show, show you guys a couple of tricks on uh, speeding up the process and becoming more efficient at it. Roger touched on it with a question from, I believe it was Andrew, uh, the tools and information that AIM has done such a great job to build into the, these gauges. It's so much more than just a dashboard now. And the, the tools that are in there allows us, if we have some creativity, to do some pretty cool things. And uh, along the way, we'll touch on, uh, you know, how these warnings are enforced um, and, and added to with some of what the gauges can do um, and what you do when the thing is flashing light at you uh, or what your crew might do, et cetera, et cetera. We'll, we'll uh, give some real life examples of, of that based on the warnings that we've put together. The next thing we're gonna have is a, is a couple of slides and the, um, the um, oops, and, and just kind of defining the, we, we mentioned that it's alarms, right? This is what we're gonna talk about, a deeper, a deeper dive into alarms. But there's really, there's really three things that are kind of uh, tie it all together. Give, your, give your, your, your 30 second overview of an alarm. We're gonna dig into a much deeper, including the one that's on your screen right now, the, uh, what, what Chris has called oil pressure dip. We're gonna actually take a look at that one. So no reason to get into them deeply, but, but uh, alarms, are, are what most people think of when they do this, but we'll also talk about status variables and triggers. Chris, give us just a little bit about uh, what an alarm is. Uh, a lot more than what woke you up in the morning. Uh, <laughs> we uh, essentially, it's a, it's a, a conditional line. Um, some people would say of, of code <laughs> um, that you're able to build into the configuration uh, step by step, line by line, so that you can alert the driver of a, a changing condition in the car with the track. Uh, maybe they scored their best lap time, uh, their qualifying lap time goal, whatever it may be, and uh, helps uh, the driver to be able to better focus on the racetrack when there is none of that stuff going on. Um, meanwhile, we're protecting doing uh, the car mechanically uh, to a large part. I mean, probably half of most people's warnings are all about, you know, temperatures and pressures and, and such in the car that'll, that'll help protect it mechanically and uh, flash the big giant proverbial idiot light. <laughs> oh, only in this case, it uh, actually gives you a lot more information. It's not just a check engine. You can put text on the bottom, uh, use, uh, as we see here displayed on the text, a number of different tools to uh, alert the driver of what's going on. And really the bottom line is the alarms are just, there are, we can send, like it says here, we can set either simple or very complex conditions, right? And, and we can stack them and, and do all sorts of things. And then once those are met, we can do a whole bunch of, of defined things. We can activate. And then, and then when it's all done, uh, you, you have some choices on how to, how to, how it goes away, conditions no longer met, the device is turned off. You know, some of them, after the data is downloaded, maybe you have a rental car that uh, you have people come in and drive and you do not want them to push a button or you don't have to dig into the software. You want that light to stay on until, uh, until you've connected and, 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 uh, and downloaded the data. So there's all sorts of options. It's kind of a walk through a process. So the, then the exactly. next one, the next one is status variables. Uh, the kind of related, we get a lot of questions of, you know what, the thing kind of looks like a, like an alarm and uh right and and uh so you know, give us a give us a walk through real quickly on 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 the status variable and we're going to show this one here we'll, we'll actually walk through this one here in just a moment so don't no reason to go into it too deeply but uh just what kind of what the difference is 
So a status variable is a, is a way to set uh, conditions, uh, traditionally, logically speaking, um, within the aim uh, unit. Uh, it's very much like a warning. Uh, however, you can actually make these uh, conditions also loggable channels so that your, uh, your logger is keeping track of whenever the car is over a certain temperature, uh, how long or how often it was over revved. Uh, it also allows you to combine um, logics uh, and types of logic. So in, in most al traditional alarms, you, you only have, you have and or you have any, uh, it, it would be all or any of the following conditions. Uh, using status variables, you can, you can turn it into uh, this, this, and this, or any of these type statement. And uh, so it opens the door to do a little bit more. Uh, it also is a kind of a precursor that'll become a lot more um, useful, prevalent, common uh, with the PDMs. Perfect. And, and what I, the, the biggest one for me that I really like is you now have a channel that's called over limit that's in your data and you can alarm on and do some other things. Uh, and it's being added to the device, as you, as you mentioned, as a logged channel. So, uh, boy, you can go in at any time, even if you missed it on the display, you can go in and, and count up the amount of time it was on or how many times did it flash. And, and it's, it's actually another channel, which you don't get that as a, as part of our alarm. So status variables, uh, add a, a piece of val a strong value to, to, a, a, a few additional things to, to add in there, which is kind of cool. Right. And so. speaking of rental drivers, you can essentially prove there was a warning here. The car did do this. It did show that this is how many times. Exactly. Exactly. And, and then finally triggers there. Uh, give us an idea of what you think about uh, trigger commands. So trigger commands are, are interesting. I, I think, I think some of it's heading somewhere that we don't know yet. And I'm, I'm excited to see where that leads. Um, in the meantime, uh, it's got some cool usefulness. Uh, if it's, you know, a certain condition happens in the car, um, the aim then does something and it's, it's more than just turning on a circuit, which we already had. Um, as, as shown here, you know, it, it can change the page uh, that you are in the dash. Um, maybe you have a, a warning come up uh, but that item, your battery voltage, isn't shown on your main page. So you could have it scroll automatically to your other page where that voltage is shown. Uh, probably the most common place people are using this so far uh, is to uh, activate rear view or reverse cameras that people have hooked up, which is shown here so that anytime it's in reverse, your display now turns into a backup camera. Yeah. So you, you can see the, the, the future where, where, especially once we get into the PDM side, th th there's a bunch of things that we can do with these three and they're all uh, linked together and tied together in different ways. So, and which we'll see a little bit of, of as well. Um, Andy mentions one uh, in, in the question and answer box. Um, it, it's something we skipped over a little bit quickly, but you know, uh, alarms, you know, often we're, we're going to set an, an LED or a, you know, a warning message across the bottom and, and uh, on the status variables and, and, and maybe even the trigger commands, you do some things and maybe you don't warn the driver, you just write it to the file with the, by adding that channel, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's something that you want to uh, count up. How many times did the fan come on on the, on the electric, uh, you know, on the thermostat, on the, on the engine temperature? And, and maybe the driver doesn't need to know that, but you would love to capture that. So you build a status variable and now all of a sudden you're just writing those to the file. So it, that, that's kind of another difference between maybe alarms and, and status uh, variables and, and triggers. Oh, absolutely. Or, or alerting the engineer, uh, but not bugging the driver during the session. Exactly. Exactly. So it, there's there's power in all of these, and and we just got to sit down and figure out which one works best for the specific instance that you're trying to do, and and build it, and then and then go. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about them in some live data. So, okay. The um, the the next the next thing I think is is, is a slide that's gonna tell us, hey, let's run into Ray Studio three, and let's start let's start looking mm -hmm. at uh, uh, you know one or two alarms and a status variable and a and a trigger, and let's look at actually how they're built, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna share reshare back to the uh, Ray Studio software. What what we've done here to and uh, Chris will take over in just a second. You can start, it, Chris. But as I kind of introduce this, what we've got here is we just got a configuration that we've built, you know, that, uh, something that Chris runs with, and uh, it's an MXG 1.2. Just so you see it, 
we've brought it over here. We're going to open it up and we're going to uh, uh, take a look. One of the things that I did there is I, I created a, uh, uh, let, let me have that for a second, Chris, yep. just to show that one more time. I, I created a manual selection. I could have gone into the devices and you could have seen, uh, you know, all configurations and, and, and seen a bunch of them. But the uh, another thing that's kind of handy in the software is you can build these little collections where maybe you have a, uh, the, uh, uh, all of your car stuff or all your smarty cam ones or, or whatever it happens to be, you can have those kind of separated out and stored in a, in, in a nice little uh, library to make this a little bit easier for you. The, um, so to make that easier to find. So, um, uh, and, and for those of us that end up with uh, a bunch or, or a lot of, even if it's just a few cars, but a lot of revisions, it's really speaking of streamlining the process, which, you know, we'll get into a little bit, especially a uh, good little Easter egg there. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, there, uh, there you go. Double click on that and let's, uh, let's jump in and start taking a look. So I built, uh, you know, it's one of the systems I use. Uh, I built this configuration from scratch for the purposes of, you know, doing the demonstration for you guys. And, uh, you know, normal uh, Ray Studio 3 configuration. You got all your stuff at the top. You got to start with, uh, you know, your channels page, which uh, has a lot of the automatic internal channels. You have your add-ons. Uh, I wanted to use an oil pressure, a couple of brake pressures that we're going to use to, you know, do some of our other stuff with. Uh, snagged an ECU stream, uh, chose a BMW because I have a lot of personal experience with that. Uh, it's a car that we won the, the AER championship with, uh, S54 swap D36. And so uh, briefly touching on the status variables, um, you know, I, I threw a couple in here. Um, we'll come back to them. We've got the math channels that we've built to, to do some math for us, kind of support our warnings to be a part of that system. Uh, trigger commands, as, as we mentioned, uh, interestingly enough, uh, so it shows all of our shift lights and alarms all in the same list, but it highlights um, our, our trigger command. We're going to get into and we're going to mention our icons uh, managers here. This is where you can set this stuff up, especially. Uh, I know a lot of you guys might be like icons. Where did that come from? Uh, I know those of you that haven't kept up, uh, all the 1.2 devices uh, and past a certain point, et cetera, et cetera, have uh, these icons available to us, which, and the third final, fifth final. Uh, link in the chain would be our displays. Um, so down here on the bottom, it's going to show us a number of icons which can add, supplement uh, the the warnings and, and display stuff or bring attention to stuff for us. Kind of cool. You can build these alarms and then, and you're going to see Chris has built, built so many that he's actually run out of the ability <laughs> to build more, but, uh, and you, and you, and you think to yourself a little bit, maybe, maybe that's, um, maybe, maybe that's a little too much, right. For, for a driver to handle during an event or, or, or things like that. But, but the, the process Chris has followed is, is it's changing displays or maybe they're in a test and they want to have just a braking, uh, one so he has a display that the the driver would reach down push the buttons and you end up in there and you're looking at for lockup or, or or different things and it's just in a breaking page all of those alarms are working in the background but when you're and you when you're on your race page or your qualifying page that uh, those are not being bothered they're not bothering the driver while he's racing but they have the opportunity if eight hours into a into an endurance race, the driver starts feeling some weird stuff on brakes. He can reach down and 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 trigger the other, uh, you know, the, the brake page and see if what the you know, if there's any warnings, if the if the if the bias has gone way out of whack or you know different things like that. So uh, don't uh, yeah, he's got a bunch of stuff here and and all of it is good to to learn from and but don't uh, don't worry about being overwhelmed because he's he's actually built in some kind of cool things to to work around that as well. Okay. So we brought up the uh, the fact that we you know kind of discuss different types of of warnings. Uh, so as you can see at the top of my list here, uh, most of this stuff is uh, would fall into the category of car health. We're looking at oil pressures, water temps, oil temps, uh, battery voltage, etc. 
Um, these uh, is a part of this kind of Venn diagram, and I probably should have uh, maybe even drawn something together, but most of these will fall into the category of um, driver information uh, in where they, they warn the driver and it's up to the driver to take action. However, you could, once your oil gets to a certain temp, uh, it would turn on a fan, at which point the, the gauge in the car using this warning is literally taking action itself. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, one of our other categories. And then the other would be something that uh, maybe the driver can't take uh, action to at the time, like using less revs, slowing down, getting out of the draft to get the car more uh, fresh air to cool off a radiator. Um, but it's my oil pressure dip channel, which we'll get into, which implies that the car is low on oil, getting low on oil, and the crew, like if it's an endurance race, the crew would add a half quart or a quart, whatever their system is, uh, during the next pit stop, and they wouldn't need to check the oil, they wouldn't grenade their motor, they wouldn't aerate their lifters and go down on horsepower, um, and it's all thanks to what we've been able to put together here. We'll go ahead and open that one up. We'll open up an open up oil pressure dip and let's uh, let's take a look how you build that thing. Sure. So we'll skip over some of the basics. There, I mean, it's basically common sense. Um, this is modeled very much like a what is and should be the number one on most people's list, which is your massive oil pressure loss. However, uh, we've chosen a number uh, of twenty five. Um, and the purpose of this channel, you know, when a car is deep in a brake zone, uh, hard in a corner, or transitional from left to right, heavy Gs, um, you can end up in a very momentary oil starvation situation where even if you had, you know, the biggest, brightest light in the world, it would flash for a tenth of a second or so short the driver wouldn't even see it. And he'd have no idea why that light flashed. Um, we've built this warning so that uh, based on looking at data from the car, what's a normal oil pressure, what's uh, at, at each RPM, you know, I've analyzed data from sessions, picked a number um, that I never see unless I'm hard in a brake zone, hard in a transition, and I have uncovered my oil R oil pickup in the race car. So it's, uh, if oil pressure is less than 25 PSI, I'm racing on the track, so over 3000 RPM, and we've called it oil pressure dip. The whole screen goes red, it tells the driver oil pressure dip, and talking about the different ways we can condition this, um, when I originally wrote it, uh, I wrote alarm end. I felt this was a very important thing. I wanted the driver to not miss it. And so the warning ends when a button is pushed, regardless of how long the actual conditions that set the alarm were. Um, I guess it's not unlike uh, your alarm clock in the morning. It, uh, it goes off at seven o'clock, but it keeps going off until you wake up and, or hits news, but to make a kind of a world, uh, real world daily life analogy. So this was good for me. I don't mind reaching up and pushing a button. Uh, I, I even, um, uh, I had this warning come up at road Atlanta, uh, through 10, a 10 B. Um, one of the hardest brake zones there is cause you're down coming down a hill and then you flatten out. So the car's under compression and then it's a hard, 90 left, 90 right. And uh, I was getting oil pressure dip warning. So I was exiting 10B, crossed up under the bridge, flat out trying to win a race. And I reach up and I push the button. Not everybody operates that way. I'm not saying anybody's worse or better or different. Everybody processes stuff different. Everybody's used to stuff different. So um, I had a driver complain, every time I, this warning comes up, I got to push a button. This is getting in the way. So I essentially changed it so that it stays on long enough that you know, and you can push a button to make it go away sooner, but it will go away in 30 seconds. 
and really the and you know uh, us chatting earlier that this this was really driven by a by an endurance racing team that is and you just roll through the oil right at, at the end of 10 or 12 hours all of a sudden these dips start to happen and because now the driver knows it he gets on the radio and and leading into the next pit stop they uh, he's already told them that hey we, we're going to need a quart of oil or or something because we know that the, the dips are starting to happen and if it was happening so quickly he didn't see it every time they come in you'd have to yeah actually dip and, and check the oil levels and, and all that so this is just a way for that the driver makes sure he knows it and that they start to 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 warn the the crew that we may need a a little bit of a top off on the oil and the driver then can adjust as well and and not you know put the car in in positions where that's happening if you know it's always when you're sloshing hard on the brakes and turning to the left let's just say with with a different car uh, maybe you take it a little bit early uh, easier uh, onto that uh, that hard left hand corner when you're on the brakes uh, because it's endurance racing you can you can modify based on some alarms like this kind of kind of handy so. oh 100% and and Roger's not making that up um, at 10A 10B I was able to smooth out my transition I lost a very small fraction amount of time. I no longer got the warning. Uh, summit point uh, between five and six, uh, same thing. Uh, super aggressive. I, I could give up a tenth of a second. It, it would come up. If I gave up a tenth of a second, maybe just smooth things out. The warning went away. So exactly. let the crew chief know. But I also, talking about our Venn diagram, I was able to take action on the spot to... Uh, better take care of the car due to the warning that caught a condition that would have been probably impossible even if I drove around staring at the dash. <laughs> and that's not good to, or healthy for the car either when you're when you're flying off the track because you're staring at the dash. So the uh, again, all of these are, the are yeah, but I didn't blow up the motor. The um, all all of these are just things that it's great that we're we're chatting about these. They may not work for you in, in you know, those of you watching, but it, it, just trying to plant the seed of just different ways of thinking of things that do work for your car. Just it's a logical uh, steps of of understanding something that you want, and then how do we best convey that to the driver at the time or the crew later, things like that. That's what these alarms and trigger commands and, and status variables are all about. It's pretty cool. Let's check out another one. Definitely. So, you know, we've got the traditional oil pressure stuff. Um, I threw in one that would uh, operate more on a, on a, a low RPM basis so that I, I knew if the, the, the car was picking up a, uh, a low pressure at idle issue, which oftentimes is, is oil temperature based that comes in handy if you're working on a car that doesn't have an oil temp gauge it can alert you that you might have an issue um also uh a hey dummy check your bearings before the next race maybe type of thing depending on your engine the program etc so um most of the rest of these the same principle just applied to a different uh condition uh, charging voltage and battery. You know, I see a lot of people with battery voltage. Uh, you know, they throw in a warning. It would be, uh, you know, if our voltage is under 11 and a half, I have no, you know, um, the battery power is low. But that doesn't help us on the racetrack because our, our voltage should be around 14. And if it's already gotten under 11 and a half, we have a, you know, we have a big issue. So I went ahead and I made, um, oops, missed the click. <laughs> low charging voltage. So I, I upped my RPM. So I, I, I'd ensure that the car is in a uh, RPM at which the alternator is, if it works, is working. And uh, battery voltage, this will depend on the car. It'll depend on your circuitry in the car, what exact uh, voltage the aim is seeing, but you'll pick a number for yourself that is uh, kind of a precursor uh, to a possible issue. If the alternator is slipping or it's an enduro car with a bunch of bright lights, um, you just installed the uh, everybody's new favorite cool suit system that draws 15 or 20 amps or something crazy, but doesn't take any ice. And, and you're beginning to overload your alternator, overheat your alternator. Um, so this is another great example of 
there might be a problem coming on, but there's also some action we might be able to take. I'll turn off one yeah. set of our lights, call in, there might, you know, I have a voltage problem, maybe our alternator is failing, the crew's gonna have tools and an alternator ready. The crew will say, hey, don't forget, you've got a second battery you can switch over to if this gets to be an issue, da 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 da, da. So there's um, uh, a good example of something like this. Um, Watkins Glen, uh, last year, uh, I was working in my first, believe it or not, first champ car race weekend and uh, voltage was uh, lost complete voltage output from the alternator. Uh, system was running at like 11 volts or something in the car. And uh, fortunately that car had a uh, water, water pump is driven by the timing belt. What had happened, uh, it kicked a belt for the alternator. But come the pit stop, which in champ car is five minutes, you got some extra time to do stuff if you got your stuff together. We had an alternator ready, we had a belt ready, we had tools ready, we had a couple of pulleys. We got a belt on that car and still got out of pit lane within five minutes. On, and if it wasn't mark. for, yep. what's that? On your mark, you still, you still made your pit time stop. Absolutely. So without a logic like this built into the car that told us we had an issue like that, we wouldn't have known and you know voltage there's only so many things you can show in a dash voltage reports are not something you usually get from a driver they're just looking at temps so um it saved our proverbial bacon and that was my first champ car victory at my first ever event with champ car and that team's first victory so it was uh a Very bit cool. of a coup, if you will. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, and again, Chris is coming at this from an endurance racing standpoint for some of these, uh, but but again, what's important to us is, is just showing you some examples of ways of thinking of things you might want to do. The uh, a couple of uh, couple of notes there that I saw while you're, while you're thinking about your next one, the um, John, John Barnum uh, mentions, he recommends setting a high voltage alarm. We, uh, my previous world was in, in, in uh, off-road racing and we used the, the Volkswagen air-cooled engines. And when those regulators would go out, it would spike up like crazy. And, the, and then when the regulator went bad, other uh, bad things would begin to happen. So a high voltage one, if your car is susceptible to that or you think that that's something you want, could easily build a, a high voltage alarm as well. The um, please cover Greg asks in the question and answer, please cover the pit speed lights. I, di I didn't see any pit speed lights in there, no. Uh, fig fig figured somebody might want to see that. Uh, up to you, Chris, if um, this is something that Chris does um, and uh, show, show, show the next one you'd like to not like to show. Okay, so I, what Roger's alluding to is I, I, I do this for a living and there's stuff that I come up with that uh, I, I, I literally can't afford because of the time I have put into it to just give it away. <laughs> and, and it's, it's not me being, you know, fill in the blank of the word that you want to use. Um, I, somebody on the internet, I said, he asked a question basically about something. He was asking a question that I'd figured out a solution to. And I told him I had it and I said, email me, I'll help you out. Da 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 da, Which I'm hundred percent happy to do with a fair arrangement. He just wanted me to post it in a public forum for everybody. I, excuse the sidebar, but I, I want to make the point that I'm happy to share and happy to help. Um, and we'll do a lot for nothing, but when it comes to certain things, um, I have to protect my investment. I also have to protect my customers who have paid me money to do this stuff for them. It wouldn't be fair to them. So, uh, however, the, the peat speed system, um, I guess we'll skip ahead and, and we're going to um, take it to kind of the next level of creativity, if you will, uh, and give you guys an example of, of what you can do with these systems if you put your mind to it. Uh, I don't hate to keep you bringing up AER, but here we go again. Uh, I'm running AER. Uh, we're in a class with a, a relatively budget oriented car, budget oriented team, spent money on the right things. Uh, competing against uh, a guy that has um, resources, shall we say, and uh, a PDM in the car with the fancy buttons, uh, $6,000 ECU, tons of dyno tuning, traction control. Maybe at the time he had the Motorsport ABS already. Uh, he does now. So 
<laughs> we're competing with him for race wins. And so he drives down the pit lane and I, I hear the sound that everybody that's been around a pro race knows is a pit speed limiter at a club race. I said, Oh, come on. <laughs> so I, I kind of put my mind to it and I said, well, <sighs> aim did such a good job building these new gauges, uh, throwing in some new logics, a bunch of stuff we can keep track of. What can I do? I can't physically limit it, but what could I do to help the driver maintain his pit speed without staring at the dashboard? So this was the result. Uh, if I hadn't already, I, I set up a calculated gear channel, uh, which we've talked about a little bit before uh, in, in other videos. Uh, two basic types. I'm a big fan of calculated versus pre-calc. What if you change your tire size? What if you this? What if you that? It's more adaptable. The pros and cons of that can be debated elsewhere. Um, but I used calculated gear so that uh, on the racetrack, this particular car would almost never use second gear. So if calculated gear is less than third gear, it's because we're coming in the pits or we're leaving the pits. We are in pit lane. And, and then I gated it with a uh, GPS speed. Uh, this is set up for, uh, I believe, Coda, where they had a relatively slow pit speed limit of, uh, if I recall, um, 30 miles an hour. So um, I didn't want it to get in the way too much, just piddling around the paddock. So we, uh, we gated it up to 15 miles an hour. Now we're kind of going somewhere. We're probably on the way out of pit lane versus just trolling around the paddock. And uh, if I'm not doing 27 miles an hour, then it's literally flashing green at the driver with a message popped up, pit speed low. Get your button gear, buddy. Go put your foot on the gas pedal a little bit more. And so without having to look at the dashboard, the uh, the entire background of the gauge is green. If you can't see that in your peripherals, you probably shouldn't be on a racetrack. <laughs> so, uh, just a great example of yeah. how out of the box. drastic of an action you can take to get the driver's attention, and not just for bad things or or you know the color red, but they they gave us the ability to put multiple uh, colors up. And so we move into a, a, a very narrow, relatively narrow, <laughs> for those that don't have an actual limiter window, where we're using the same logic. Uh, the, everything is written out almost the same way, except instead of taking up the whole screen, it just says pit speed good on the bottom. And uh, a two mile an hour window, window. essentially. Yep. And uh, not only does that help the driver I just see white lights. Uh, white's kind of a neutral color. I'm gonna take a neutral action. I'm gonna maintain my speed. I found that the longer the drivers and the longer that I did this and used this, the better that we were able to hear the RPM and the more that we learned exactly what the right speed sounded like. So it uh, not only was it a great indicator, it was a great teaching tool. Um, that then even we didn't have to rely on it as much, even though it was there to crutch us. And then like all race car drivers like to do, if you put your foot on the gas a little too much, our, our lights go from white to flashing red, or as they call it, flash, fast blinking. The entire screen goes red, pit speed high, and I did it in a, in a 10 mile an hour window that if you blew through that, I, I don't know what to yeah. do for you. <laughs> if, if you exceeded 10 over your, you, you really ought to know it already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to gate it somehow or else you, you get some false alarms out on the track and, and we, uh, and we don't want that either. So. Well, you so would, that, especially that. on a track where you might use second gear, yeah. but, uh, and Coda was a good example of that, by the way. Um, however, uh, we weren't under 30 on a racetrack unless, the situation dictated it and, yeah. and, you know, a one or two off occasion we can ignore, exactly. but this was a, a, a idea where, you know, situations twisted me to get my gears turning in my head. What can I do to kind of yeah. add my guys? And it's been a big fan. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I, I was, uh, we didn't actually look at this when we were chatting uh, before we had this uh, webinar, but a couple things I might even add to that, and I'll just throw them out for you right now, Chris, of and for everybody watching. You had your button set up, and it was a speed or a gear, and, and you know what? Another one is maybe if you did a uh, another filter would be if the lateral G, an absolute value of the lateral G was less than like 0.2. In other words, you're going straight. Mm. That would take care of some slow corners and make, yep. and, and as an additional one, and maybe Absolutely. if the, it would only come on if the throttle is, uh, is less than 30%. So that gets rid of some areas on the track where you maybe were going slow and trying to, trying to hustle the car and it, it might've got some false, just some ideas. Again, all of us are watching, all of us are thinking through these things. And uh, uh, if you're gonna create one of these pit road speed limiters, maybe, uh, maybe that's another way. I've also seen a couple of guys, and this makes it very, very uh, track specific. But you can you can have a distance channel that you can have in there as well, and and uh, we can say that it's only at a certain distance down the track, so you know where pit in is, and we can actually gate it with a with with a distance distance command as well. I think so. It might might be something to think about, but I think um, what you've done takes care of ninety five percent of the uh, of the false alarms, and then if you did throttle and lateral G's, boy, you're 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 there, right? You you, you rarely would get a, a false alarm, so. Perfect, kind of cool, kind of cool. Just another outside of the box way of, uh, of thinking about it. So uh, we've, got about, uh, we've got about eight or 10 minutes left, Chris. What about, uh, what about status? Do you, do you have an example of, uh, of anything else outside of the alarm part that we might want to go look at? So I do, you know, you say, okay, well, status variables, I can log it, that's cool. What am I gonna do with it? Um, you know, we alluded to the fact that in the near future, you'll be able to do even more. In the meantime, um, I came up with a, a couple of things that I, I wanted to, to log. I also combine a couple of things. Um, so I set up an overrev channel. Now you can use analysis and you can use a, a track report and you can, you can get it to tell you when did it go over X RPM. Um, but you know, in, in a lot of cases you have, you have an engineer setting up the car, but you might have a different guy doing the data. Uh, you might be reviewing the data after the fact. You might have given that specific driver a certain rev limit, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the situation may be. This over rev condition allows the person that is, you know, maintaining that car that day, setting up the data system that day to set an RPM limit for that day or that session. And then anytime that number, which is independent of any warning uh, of, of any track report being done after the fact, et cetera, et cetera, it's logged. That car ran more RPM than the driver was told to, the engineer wanted it to that day. Um, it's an endurance race. We're supposed to be saving fuel. Which one of my drivers isn't? <laughs> Whatever. Um, my imagination isn't the biggest and I'm not the brightest. Um, who knows what you would think of? Um, that's a collective you all. Um, but I wanted to show a couple examples of, of you know, what I was able to, to think while I'm Perfect. putting this together for you guys need to i then that. need to cancel yeah, that would help you if I... yep there you go and then the over limit one is i know what i'm doing i swear yeah. yeah the over over limit one is is interesting to me because you you've stacked in a number of things and you didn't have to make a whole bunch of them you made uh made one that is this, this overall you know hey we something went over the limits we we set before we went out for the day that's kind of an interesting one Right, so we, you know, using what status variables will allow you to do, which is, is co combine uh, conditions uh, and even sometimes the, the type of logic that you're using for your conditions. And so I stacked a bunch of things in here and this could be the same thing where you're setting your limits for the day. And what we did here is, you know, did the, essentially did the oil pressure ever dip under uh, predetermined value? Uh, water temp, did, did we get warm? That's not my hot number, but that's my warm number. That's my, um, we might need to address it number. Uh, same thing with the gearbox and the engine oil temps. And I put in the empty, empty number, but maybe you'd put in 10 liters or 20 liters. Do I need to put gas in the car? You know, if, <laughs> if assuming your channel works the way you'd expect it to, want it to, need it to. So what we then did with that is we built an alarm if I Here's where we're starting to tie these things together now. Where exactly you're some space, and I called it check car. And if over limit is true, 
uh, I used a, a unique color light that doesn't get used for anything else. In this case, I'm not using LED eight for anything else. And if any of that happened to be true, when that car pulls in to the pits, that light will be on. And in fact, this is, this is uh, where the strategy of when does that alarm end comes into play. Um, I thought about if the device is turned off, but then I said, well, what if the drivers, and not that I wouldn't catch it eventually, but what if the driver, uh, you know, powers a car down while I'm not looking and I, I would miss it. But in this case, I, I used until data is downloaded, which is a little uh, higher maintenance. Uh, I'm going to have to download the data to, to get it to pump up. But while the mechanic is checking the grill for grass or the oil level or putting gas in the car, me or my engineer can pull the data, see what else was going on. Um, and uh, so it's a big blanket warning. Hey, um, race car needs a little bit of attention, guys, to take a look at it. So that's uh, a good example of status variables, but also in a sense, um, an example of the creativity that you can have when you're putting all this stuff together. Another, th another, uh, you've got a number of them that you have pushed the button to get to get rid of it, right? Which is a great idea, uh, all good. Some of these dashes are are, are way out in, in front of us or the driver doesn't want to reach around the steering wheel while it's doing it. One of the cool things, and I just reached over and grabbed it off out of a, of a drawer. Uh, some of you might be able to see it on the camera, but we, uh, AIM has this, this really cool little can device that it just plugs into your five port can on, on all your AIM devices. And on the other end, it's just a bunch of wires, right? And you, it, it's a remote button. So if you wanted to, you could on your steering wheel, put the four buttons from the, from the, from your aim display and through, through a can connection, you just have a remote way of pushing buttons. So if, uh, if you think that maybe this is kind of cool to have that button to, to push things off and especially in an endurance race, uh, but yet the, the a little cumbersome reaching around the steering wheel or, or maybe it's too far away, boy, it's something as simple as this makes that task a lot easier. Put them in tight on the steering wheel where it's away from the radio button, things like that. Uh, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a solution to, to go ahead and be able to use your, your remote buttons, kind of a cool tool. Yeah, and then maybe my driver wouldn't complain about me making him push the button so many times. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, we so, got just a couple more minutes. What? Uh, where else would you like to go as we as we're kind of finishing up? Well, I uh, I mentioned icons a little bit, and I, and I talked about um, you know supplementing and taking action. We probably covered the taking action part, but as far as supplementing warnings, uh, I wanted to just show a couple okay. examples of that, um, and one of which is using the icons manager and tool, which AIM has, has been so gracious to throw in our direction. Um, For the TFT screens, one of the questions we have over here in the list is, is what can we do on an MXL2? There, there are some things that the MXL2 cannot do that some of the TFT screens, the color ones, uh, this is being one of them, Greg. So uh, I do not have a list of, of all the different things that work on the different ones, but uh, you and I can get together, you can call uh, you know, our tech support line and we can figure out what works on the MXL2s as well. But a lot, typically the same structure works, some of the color things that we're talking about here today obviously don't work. Yeah, so. Color things are off. And then when it shows a message, you lose some measures, which could be important. So uh, that's where I learned I needed to make my messages on a MXL2 timed yep. um, or cancelable because uh, learning by experience, I had covered up uh, some measures that were important. Hey, check your voltage, except I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just real basic, uh, you know, if water's warm, you know, the traditional universal symbol is yellow. If it's hot, it's red. Uh, check engine light, ABS file. Um, not only do these show on your display, regardless of what else is going on, what other lights are blinking, et cetera, et cetera. It can also be uh, good when you are uh, working with drivers where the English may not be their first language. Uh, if you pick a page that has the icons as part of it, which which you have done on uh, on this one that's called race. The exactly. um, the other thing that's cool about it is maybe you've got a driver's come in and working with the team and he doesn't understand all your naming structures and all that. 
Boy, an ABS warning uh, icon is, is universal, right? We all jump in a car and if we see that water temperature or a, the little oil pressure symbol or an ABS, uh, we all kind of know what that is just from, you know, just from uh, driving your street cars. So at least, at least the street cars I drive with uh, 200,000 miles, we, I, I get these warnings, but maybe everybody else doesn't get them as much, right? Right. And, but, and, he, uh, and he, he figures it out before the end of the straightaway instead of having to ask on the radio. Yeah, Meanwhile, either, yeah. he's gotten to the break zone by the time we get an answer to him. Yeah, that's not good. That's that's not the time to figure that one out. So pretty cool. Uh, and and there's the pages we talked about earlier. You know, Chris has different pages. The the, the status variables can trigger these pages. The triggers can page change pages. And there's it, it all ties together. We we're, this is not a super deep dive into this. It, it's more of a going a little bit deeper and and start to to wet your whistle and start to understand. You know, hey, you know, is that uh, is that something we want want to do? We might want to uh, bring Chris back and, 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 and take it to the next, to the next level here and, and, and you know, later on in September or something too. Let, let us, let me know if uh, you think that might be good in the chat box. So finish this up and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll run into our, our next webinar poll here in just a moment after you kind of tidy us all up. Sure. Sure. So uh, elaborating on the uh, supplementing warnings. Uh, one of the other things they've given us, which um, I don't think I showed in any specific example, but I wanted to mention because it deserves it. Um, we can change the color of these texts based on conditions. It can be blue during the warm-up process. It can be yellow when it's warm and it needs attention or advisement. It can be red when it's over temp, etc. cetera. So um, that's a neat thing with that. I wanted to touch on uh, prioritizing warnings so if we, ah, there you go. Yeah. Good point. You know, they give us the ability to, you know, drag and drop these wherever we want. So my new one shows up at the bottom, but if I need it to be more important, I can slide it up to the top. We have to decide how we prioritize. Um, generally oil pressure is most important. We can debate uh, whether water temp or oil temp would go next. Uh, the great thing about these new devices is we've got a lot of lights available to us. Now you have to decide how to use them. Um, there are so many colors. You could use a different color for each status, uh, each measure, I guess. You could use a color for oil, a color for water, a color for whatever, which is creative and it makes sense. However, you're, you're getting away from the universal green is good, yellow is okay, red is bad. Um, and you have to decide, we have a lot of lights to use. Are you going to use an individual light for each type of condition? Are you going to use a lot of lights because you think it gets more attention? That's where you might use all the lights, but you use a different color. But then if you have two or three different warnings, only the text for only one is showing on the bottom. So you, you want to use it. important. You want to use a little bit of strategy and I, I tried a few different things and I did land on the fact that, you know, and if you go through this, you can see, you know, I, I put oil pressure, all my oil pressure stuff is mostly one, unless it's all of them. Uh, you know, I put water temp on two, oil temp uh, on three. And if you look at the other warnings, I use a different color, but I'll use the same, same location. Uh, so you can label it on your dash. The crew can know what numbers what, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then as far as priority goes, you know, you have to make sure nothing, like for example, um, nothing that's low is gonna take your screen and turn it red and cover up other stuff that you need to see um, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, touching back on uh, MXL2, if you're showing text, you're, you're not showing some of your measures. So, you know, you have to kind of take that into account as you, as you write your warnings and, uh, and, and kind of organize everything and put it together. Okay. And uh, I think that's enough for now, Roger. What do you think? I, th I think we've given them a lot. And not uh, that, that was a smooth, graceful end, but. No, no. I think you've given them a lot. There's a, there is a, again, it's not, it, what he showed you today and what's in here is not the perfect for your car. What we basically, you know, to, to review real briefly, it's, it's, it's really about you're looking at your data and analysis or from sitting in the seat of the car and you're going, boy, I wish I knew 
uh, I knew that, right? While, while we're driving or the, the driver would get that feeling. And then you start to build these and you build them into ways that work for you. I, I think we do have a, another uh, process in the, in the future where we maybe go in and, and build a brand new one and, and, and add in some, some, uh, you know, some more logic and, and some different things. Maybe we do that in, in another month or so. So it, but, uh, uh, great, uh, great topic, great, great questions. And, and I, and I, and I enjoyed it. Let's, um, Let's kind of start to close this out. Let me let me screen share a different uh, back to the presentation for a second, and uh, and talk about this one. We went through some stuff in a hurry, right? As we always do with these things, and and it's and it's strategic that we do that. It's we want to get as much information in as we can in in our in our hour that we have. Because of that, we put these things up within an hour or so. This will be up on the up on our YouTube page, and you can go back to find them uh, and within a day or go back and review the certain section that maybe uh, did he, you know, how did he do that again? Where did he click? What did he say about that? Uh, all good. Watch it, rewatch it on on YouTube. Down in the description box, we end up with uh, the questions and answers that were asked. Those of you that are watching only on YouTube may not had not been able to see those. Those will all be put into a document after we we have to compile it and put it together. Within a few days, that will be uh, down in the in the box. Um, so we'll have uh, you know, things like that. We'll link to the videos that uh, set some of the basics for what we talked about today down in the description box too. So YouTube is a very part, very powerful tool of, of how we're doing these webinars. So keep that in mind. Go check, go check out the YouTube page. The um, customer support. Chris is a huge customer support guy, just like we are here at AIM. It's important to us. These are not devices that are uh, you, you just buy off the shelf and, and and stick them in there. You need to you need to learn, and we need to be here to help you learn those. And Chris helps a ton of people, and that's what uh, that's what we do as well. Yeah, give us a call you. or give, give Chris a call as well. Absolutely, I appreciate that plug, Roger. Um, email, website, etc. Uh, I wanted to plug AIM and, and thank AIM for putting together a product. Now, Roger said they're not 100% plug and play. I, I use AIM uh, because I, I feel like they strike a great, great balance between uh, usability and what they can do and what, you know, what, uh, what we can accomplish with the units. And uh, I think it's a better balance than anything else in the market. So appreciate yeah, that yeah. very much there and we and we feel the same way the next webinar very popular early on i'm going to go ahead and just launch the poll real quickly while we're kind of chatting about it very popular that uh, you know i try to take all the feedback i can get on emails and in the chats and in the q a and and, and all of this stuff and we try to build a um, uh, an idea of what's the next four or five webinars that are coming we're giving you here the option of of, of selecting what we're going to do on tuesday I also made it a multiple answer. So, you know, maybe you take your top three vote, you know, don't, you know, obviously you don't want to just click on them all or you cancel your votes, but uh, pick, pick a, pick two or three that you think, and, and here in just a minute, we're going to share it and uh, we, we will have set our next webinar. So, so uh, keep, keep that in mind as you're, as you're voting, looking forward to seeing what, uh, what we're going to do. Funny story as you're voting, uh, did this once before back in, uh, back in uh, July, I think very popular again, uh, I say it. And um uh, the trouble was, is I decided to do this and I did it on a Tuesday and, and everybody selected a, a topic and I had uh, very little time to prepare. So this one, I chose to do this on a Thursday. So I have the weekend to, to work on it and, 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 and become prepared. So make sure you pick your vote. I'm going to leave that up and running while we kind of go to our, our final slide. If you voted and you submitted it, that box will pop out of your way. We'll share the results in just a second. But um, finally, I'd like to go ahead and, uh, and bring up kind of our closing slide. Thank you, Chris, for coming and doing this. This was Chris's first uh, co-hosting role that he's done with us. The, okay, um, it wasn't too obvious. The, the uh, had, had a good time. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's Chris's uh, contact information, RolloRacing at uh, gmail.com or RolloRacing.com. The link has been uh, to his website in the chat box a few times. Um, give, give Chris a holler and, uh, and ask him any detailed information. Uh, you know, chat to him about how, uh, how you guys can work together and maybe get, uh, get some stuff uh, uh, designed and worked out for you, it, it'll, it'll be a good time. I think there's there's super value for a lot of folks there. So uh, again, to thank you to Chris. Thanks to, to, to all of our AIM guys that have been in the background. They've been answering questions um, that, uh, that we could not fit into the, to the live version. Uh, thanks, thanks to all those guys as well. Uh, it's kind of slowed down on the vote. So I, my, it, it's been open for a couple of minutes. Let's go ahead and uh, let's, open, let's open this up. Ooh, it's a very, very close vote so for, the, for the top two. Um, let's, let's end the polling and let's show you what they are. 
Let's end the polling and share the results. Here are the results. The, the, the results are tips and tricks in Race Studio 2 analysis. The, um, the one that was right behind it is basic suspension analysis. Uh, and I'm a little bit torn <laughs> because because uh, I I really want to do the basic suspension analysis as as well, but there are some um, um, uh, tips and tricks in Race Studio Two analysis. That's what we're going to do. We we we, uh, we we go by our vote. But what I think I will do is while we'll talk, uh, I, I have a lot of seminars already kind of tied together. We don't share exactly who's going to be here yet, but uh, uh, the very first open that we're going to do, the very first open date that I have, the next one will be a suspension analysis. I promise you. Uh, because it, 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 I mean, it's uh, uh, the, the the number of votes were uh, the percentages were were, were basically two percent, and I'm looking at the raw numbers. We don't show those, but uh, it was two votes different, less than the than the than the than the, the analysis, the tips and tricks. So we're going to so, do tips and tricks. So Roger, if you and I vote, then you know we can do something <laughs> even, right? I I, uh, I I try not to do that. I tried to be, <laughs> but uh, but anyway, you uh, we're gonna do tips and tricks, and there's some really cool little things. While we have talked about different functionality and how you you race race studio, I'm gonna come up with uh, maybe it's a top ten list, or maybe it's a top five. Maybe I'll bring somebody in as a as a co-host, and we'll. Uh, We'll tackle little things that will make your life a lot easier in Race Studio 2. Some of them you may know, some of them we may give you more information about, some of them will, will be new to you that uh, will help you in the, in the analysis of data in Race Studio 2. So, and then we'll, uh, we'll sneak in right behind that to, as quickly as we can with the suspension analysis. I ask a bunch of people uh, the last day or so to, to help build this list. And, uh, and I bet you three quarters of the people that answered back says, it mentioned suspension analysis, something we had not covered, but that yet they get a lot of questions about. So we will, uh, uh, I'd already made up my mind, we're going to do it no matter uh, where the vote came. So because of just the, the, the information back. So, so there you go. There's your, there's your poll results. Well, we're going to talk tips and tricks and race studio analysis, deeper ones than what we've uh, even talked about in the past. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody for coming. I appreciate every, uh, Chris, you, you taking your time to do this. Do you have anything else to add here as we're, as we're kind of closing this out? Uh, Totally, 100%. Uh, grateful and flattered that you reached out and invited me to be a part of this. Um, I jumped at the opportunity, and uh, look forward to the opportunity. Of hopefully, being back. We're gonna. We're, we'll, we will have you back as long as you'll come. Uh, Scott Sterling says uh, you should do all of them at one point. Yeah, Scott, absolutely. <laughs> uh, they're on my list of things to do. Uh, I, I asked for some others, and and uh, they. They, they helped me cement that these are all important topics. All of these will be done at some point. Uh, I haven't announced it yet, but I think in the next day or two, you will get an email about these webinars that we're gonna extend them through the end of September. Right now, they're, 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 they're scheduled to end from the Zoom side uh, at the end of August, and I, we're gonna extend it through the end of September. And so all of these should fit in there somewhere uh, in the, the two a week that we do. So That's exciting. Uh, two quick things I'll add if you, if you let me, Roger. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, continuing my, my earlier thought, um, if it wasn't apparent, um, I really geek out on this stuff. I enjoy it. Uh, I love the, the, the strategy and the imagination. Um, yes, there have been late nights of me yelling at my computer, why won't this work? This should work. Um, but the on-track results, when I finally get it right, have always been worth it. And I absolutely um, enjoy the process of teaching and sharing what I've learned uh, teaching people data, teaching people stuff on the track. Uh, I find it, find it very rewarding. If I could afford to do it for free, I would. <laughs> I want to make that point. And then the other thing is uh, tips and tricks for Race Studio 2. Uh, that is like, <laughs> that's what keeps me coming back to, to all of your seminars, Roger, because every time uh, you either you figured out a new trick, I listen well enough to catch another trick, or uh, have built up to a point where I'm ready for the next thing. And, and so it, you know, we talked about streamlining a, a the process. Uh, speaking of things that we'll have to say for next time, um, Roger's tricks will be invaluable. So don't miss that one. It will be a good time. I, uh, the, just like you this time and I this time working with you as we've prepared for this one, there has not, I don't think there is number 42 right now, right? There hasn't been one of these webinars that's gone by that I haven't learned something about the, you know, uh, the process or, or about, uh, about the software or about the hardware. Uh, the, these have been wonderful for me as well and, and as well as everybody that's listening. Uh, and the last thing I'd like to add is we, as, we're, as we're closing this out, 
we have got a stellar group of co-hosts coming up. You will it, 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 hmm. boggle your mind when we uh, when we start to to release those. We've had great co-hosts so far. Some of those are going to continue to come back through September. I've got a list over here on my uh, on my uh, table of folks that have agreed to come in here. Virtually all of those are going to be guys that you know, and they're uh, they're folks that are uh, uh, industry giants. So they're uh, going to come on and, and co-host with us. Keep your eyes open. Watch your email. Uh, we'll we'll start to release some of those names and and who's going to come in and what they're going to talk about shortly. So I appreciate it again, Chris. I appreciate everybody coming. I appreciate like crazy the the AIM guys that have worked work with me, and and a lot of work goes into these, and the and all of these guys are super busy on our compressed motorsport schedule. Thanks for all of you doing what you're doing, and uh, looking forward to seeing you and and the work that we'll put in and get ready getting ready for next Tuesday's webinar. So thanks everybody for coming and we'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you all.